Uh, welcome to the session. This is a very exciting session. Um, we'll have six presentations. Um, unfortunately, two of our presenters were not able to participate in person. Uh, you know, visa and resource um, funding problems. So they'll be or will be presenting their talk uh, as pre-recorded uh, presentations here um, to facilitate questions and answers and them to participate in the discussion. We've created the um, uh, WhatsApp group. I hope that um, you can actually uh, scan this and join the group. Um, so I'll be encouraging everyone to actually ask questions, especially to those presenters um, through WhatsApp while the presentation is running so that, so that we can, they can answer the questions. Um, for the interest of time, I ask the speakers to try to keep it to 10 minutes and um, we'll skip to questions and have a discussion in, in which time um, questions can be asked to all presenters. My name is Aaron Turak. I have two hats. One is Chair of Freshwater Biodiversity Observation Network and the other is a research scientist in a government agency in, in Australia. I work with indigenous communities and local communities on community-based monitoring uh, in Australia. Um, so this topic is close to my heart. Um, uh, I will now present to you uh, Can you have the first speaker's slides? Um, sorry, no, it's Nohu Sungrana. It's um, number two. No, who are you here? Thank you. All right. Well, <laughs> um, I saw him just earlier, but um, he seems to have disappeared. Um, maybe yeah, is there my here? Um, yeah, look, um, I think we might actually go to number three. Oh. Is that your presentation? Am I? Corrupted. Yeah, this is one for the books. How many things can go wrong in a session? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, know who is here. So, um, come on up, know who. So can we go to number two uh, while you sort out? Yeah. Okay. Okay, everyone. I will introduce you to Nohu Zungrana from uh, Burkina Faso. Please introduce yourself and start your conversation, um, presentation. That's for forward. Um, try to point, I think it works well when you point there. But
Okay. It's working. Okay. It's working. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for the late. Here is the Nozungrana from Burkina Faso. But the program that I'm belong is from Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. And the research was done in Burkina Faso, my homeland. So just to highlight you some innovation, some local and traditional null techniques that uh, local communities from Burkina Faso, even from other countries of the Sahel region, are using to restore land. So next, so we are there to present beyond of the community-based monitoring and traditional knowledge session. So as planned, I'll go to an introduction, the material and methods that used, and I will show you the result and some discussion, and to end it with conclusion and uh, recommendation. So maybe I don't know if uh, all of us is common seeing this kind of ecosystem. This is a degraded lens from Burkina Faso and other part of the world. And then this some um, information uh, to let you know that it's a key issues that's affecting all ecosystem like biodiversity also and that's affecting our livelihoods. And uh, this is from erosion, deforestation, and uh, some unsustainable use land use and some anthropogenic activities such uh, deforestation also. And then uh, Burkina Faso is facing land degradation and desertification that's exacerbated by climate change and biodiversity loss. And as answer, we have to go to reforestation and also to some sustainable agriculture practice that those are from local and traditional knowledge in my country. So why we did this research is because uh, most of the time, traditional and local knows are not well documented in terms of research. And now we have to go to evaluate some impacts of these techniques focusing in localities like Zitenga. And uh, this research was focused on agricultural lands. As a research objective, the general objective was to assess the effectiveness of land and traditional, local and traditional agricultural land restoration techniques as a tool of restoring degraded land in the context of climate change and also desertification. And as specific objective, we have first of all to identify this technique, second time to analyze stakeholders' perception, and third time to evaluate their effectiveness. And uh, as material and method that we use, the study area is, um, was uh, Zitenga. Zitenga is from uh, one of the region of Burkina Faso. We have 13 region. And uh, So Zitenga is almost of 750 kilometers and uh, have a 46 village and uh, is a semi-arid region like Burkina Faso with low precipitation and uh, 500 to 900 millimeters per year. Sorry, no, okay. So maybe I will use my slide. A sample, yeah, this was the, where data, data was collected. Yeah, and uh, data was collected from 26, uh, 20, 
three villages from the Zitenga municipalities, and uh, we was focused on uh, farmer adoption on land restoration techniques, and uh, we identify uh, 134 farmers, and uh, 14 uh, stakeholders was interviewed, and uh, as research methodologies to assess these uh, local and traditional node restoration techniques, we go first of all with literature reviews, and uh, we go around for data collection with some tools like Kobo Collect. And then for data analysis, yeah, we use uh, Kobo Collect and GPS to collect data, and then we go to Excel, and then to analyze qualitative data with MaxQDA and uh, quantitative data with Statistica and R and Excel too. Let's go now for result and discussion. What we found from the 134 farmers, yeah, most of the farmers was male because uh, women don't have access to land and also they don't have too much time for labors. And uh, in terms of age, farmers' age was between uh, 47 to 57 years. And in terms of uh, education, they don't have formal education. And in terms of uh, number of adult members, they have between five to 16 persons in their families. And they are inheritance with lands. And the type of um, operation, the lands were used for personal. Yeah. And in terms of farm size, The farm size, most of the farm size was between uh, four to 10 acres. Yeah, in terms of uh, knowledge, we got to result that uh, most of the knowledge are from local, uh, traditional knowledge and combined with scientific one and also with experience in the, in the structures. And the research was in comprehensive and effective restoration strategies. In terms of the most used ones, we have some techniques that we call zypids, stone bonds, graph strip, uh, farmer managed natural resolution, melching, half moons. And in terms of these techniques, this is the half moons. This is before and after the use. And after that, we have the zypids. This is after the, the using of these techniques. And after that, we have the melting with uh, some willow edge. That's before and after. And this is the stone bonds. Yeah, before going to that, I want to highlight that the names of these techniques is just a translation from French or from local uh, names. They have also local names. And in terms of gender use of this land restoration, results show us that uh, men and women have the same uh, result, but women are, using, are not using most these restoration techniques. In terms of uh, alignment with sustainable development goals, these, uh, tec these techniques uh, give us uh, alignment with uh, SDG 1, 2, and 8 in terms of the rule of sustainable land management in food security and uh, power, poverty reduction. And in terms of uh, ecosystem restoration, and also in terms of uh, land restoration and biodiversity conservation. Yeah. And in terms of uh, enhancing land and water interdependencies from SDG 6 and 14. In terms of uh, benefit of these techniques, results showed us that yeah, they can increase the yield. This can help to soil fertility, bringing back biodiversity, improve livelihoods in terms of forests, and in terms of uh, regeneration of our ecosystems. And this is um, some data from the use of this technique before and after. Before they use, they have a, a means of five in terms of crop yield per 100 kilometers back, and after that, they have the double, almost a means of 11. 
So in terms of ethnobotanical use of plant species that they are using in terms of uh, agroforestry, in terms of medicinal use, in terms of cooking woods, and in terms of uh, shading, and in terms of uh, forests, and in terms of domestic use. So this uh, help them to maybe providing ecosystem services and enhancing uh, human well-being. Also deep connection between plant and resources and daily lives and also vegetation in supporting livestock and enhancing agroforestry adoption with economic benefits. So in terms of conclusion, after this research we saw that they are using multiple of uh, these techniques and uh, we have to move now for the integration of traditional and scientific knowledge being in these gaps. And uh, the, this study permit us to highlight the positive correlation between the application of these techniques and uh, in terms of increasing crop yields and soil fertilities. And in terms of recommendation, this recommendation is not only for this research, but only for all over people that are working in land restoration and traditional and indigenous knowledge. First of all, we have to collaborate among stakeholders, such as scientists, practitioners, NGOs, and researchers. And uh, secondly, we have to have to create a database to document and share this information because uh, this information, these techniques is using in some region in our countries. And in turn, we have also to advocate for incorporation of these techniques and these knowledge in national policies. And uh, we have also to encourage the adoption and scaling up of traditional and local knowledge-based restoration techniques in uh, rural communities. And uh, we have to bridge the gap between traditional knowledge and uh, modern scientists by encouraging collaboration between indigenous knowledge projects and scientists. And what's next? We have to co-develop projects with local communities applying this agricultural land restoration techniques. Maybe uh, processing with some research in such as MSc or maybe PhDs in terms of establishing a system of monitoring and evaluating these impacts and also assessing the soil carbon dynamic and uh, also the use of these new tools like uh, remote sensing data and GIS tools. Yeah. So now thank you for your attention and uh, merci. Thank you, Noha. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, so we'll skip the questions, um, try to do it all at the end. Um, I'll introduce you to Emma Bacon, who is from Concordia University. Um, Hi, my name's Emma. I go to Concordia University and I'm a first year master's student. And today I'll be presenting um, what I will be doing for my master's, which is taking a closer look at urban forest diversity in Montreal using a public and private tree inventory placed along an urbanization gradient. Oh God. There we go. So, Urbanization continues to increase globally with about 82% of North Americans living in cities. And within urban landscapes, there's an increasing need for green spaces. Um, these green spaces maintain and provide e ecosystem services to the residents in cities. There are a lot of things that these spaces do for residents, including uh, filtering stormwater, regulating air temperature, and reducing air pollution. Overall, trees are important to both people and the ecosystem and are an important factor in citywide biodiversity. Oops. 
So not all urban forests are created equally, and a diverse urban forest is really important for maintaining the ecosystem services that trees provide. So um, for example, studies have found that most urban forests are dominated by just a few key species. In Montreal, for example, the top 10 most abundant tree species represent 70% of all public trees in the city. And um, when a, an urban forest can be threatened by many things, including climate change, urban growth, um, exotic pests and diseases, and having an, a, a diverse urban forest reduces the level of vulnerability of a city's uh, trees. So thus it's very important to have research that quantifies the diversity of uh, urban trees and the urban forest. Sorry, this is doing something. Okay, so this is an example that many of you may be familiar with. Um, this is a case of the emerald ash borer, which is an invasive species that um, decimates ash population across North America. And before this infestation really took, uh, took its toll, one in five trees in Montreal were ash trees. And here's an example here that just visualizes how um, destructive this disease can be. On the left here, we have a city street. These are all public street trees before infestation. And you can see that all the trees are very healthy. But then after infestation, that same row and that same street now has all these dead and sick trees. And that's because this area is not diverse. And this causes an issue for residents of neighborhoods that have less diversity because now they aren't receiving the ecosystem services that these trees were providing. So they don't have the canopy um, and uh, all the things that trees provide. So within a city, trees are managed by various different managing bodies. Trees can come from a variety of different green spaces, including uh, public trees, such as street trees and public parks. They can also come from institutional land, uh, private yards, alleys. There's a whole array of places that trees come from. And trees within a city aren't evenly distributed. So some areas might be receiving more ecosystem services or have higher tree diversity um, than other areas. And the issue with our current understanding of especially Montreal's biodiversity and tree diversity, is that we use citywide public tree data to get information on a city's biodiversity. And that means that we're not taking into account all these different green spaces that are not included in public trees. So in order to get a better understanding of the city's true tree biodiversity, we need to have a way to take count for all these trees in all these different green spaces. So what are the trees that are most commonly excluded from the public tree inventory? That's private trees. Private trees account for 50% of all trees in, uh, in the city, and um, they provide many services to residents. So here, oh, whoa. Sorry, um, let me try to go back. If not, I'll just say it. Um, so what I was going to show is an example of a neighborhood in Montreal. And in the neighborhood in Montreal, a certain percentage of the trees have been, collect have been inventoried by cities and they're considered public trees. But there's a whole other part of the a neighborhood that is not being accounted for in this inventory. And the thing with private trees is that there's many different people that govern private trees as opposed to a city um, that manages all the public trees. So for example, neighbors might have different preferences for different tree species, um, even though they're right next to each other. Or schoolyards might have completely different preferences in trees and traits compared to apartment complexes. So because the preferences change a lot for private trees and the people who govern them, it's really important to have an idea of what private trees are in a neighborhood. So that's the kind of the goal of my project, to get an idea of private tree inventory in Montreal. So here are two past urban forest inventories in Montreal that provide kind of the basis for my project. So the first on the left is the NGG community tree inventory, uh, uh, inventory that was um, done by a past student in my lab, Kaylee Hutt-Taylor. She did this tree inventory in the summer of 2020. 
um, near Concordia's Loyola campus. And this inventory, she categorized um, the neighborhood into different green space types, inventoried all public and private trees. And what she found was that private trees contributed unique species that weren't found in our public tree inventory. And she also found that in private yards, there was higher uh, tree species richness. So those were the findings of her study. On the right here, we have another study, which is by my colleague Rita Souza Silva at uh, UCAM, a Université de Quebec à Montréal. And this was a pilot study where she um, created a plot around the UCAM Biosciences Complex, also inventoried all public and private trees, but she found that public trees were more diverse and there was more public trees. So there's two different kind of results that we see from these two studies. And the interesting thing about these two studies is on the left, Kaylee in the Concordia study used citizen science, which was mostly due to the complications around the COVID-19 pandemic, versus here we use traditional methods. So my goal was kind of to combine those two methods and um, that way be able to have a larger sample where we're comparing different types of neighborhoods. Because here on the left we have a very residential neighborhood, here we have very institutional. So it just shows that green space type might affect the results that we see. So based on my colleagues' research, I kind of have two main questions that I want to answer. The first is how do green space types differ in tree composition and structure at the neighborhood and also the citywide scale? So I'll determine the fine scale composition um, of trees in the city and um, compare different plots across the city with each other. So I expect that public and private spaces are going to have different tree diversity because they have different purposes in the urban landscape. My second question is, to what extent are these differences in tree diversity explained by urban form and socio-demographic factors across the city? Um, if we look at uh, plots across gradients, we can see that maybe um, differences in tree diversity can be explained by other factors, uh, such as uh, population density or uh, socioeconomic factors. So to do this, I used um, an observatory called the Urban Observatory on the island of Montreal. This is a collection of 25 plots that spanned across the island, and it was created in 2021 by my co-supervisor's lab, Anna Paquette at UCAM. And um, this observatory is used for a bunch of different studies, including studying pollen, uh, soil, insects, and many more across the city. And what we wanted to do was create a tree inventory in these plots. So in 2022, there was a preliminary study by my colleagues at UCAM, and uh, they did a radius of 100 meters counting every tree. And this summer, I went out again, expanded this radius to 200 meters, and I was able to count um, the public and private trees in this area. And the interesting thing about our 25 plots is that they're placed along three gradients. They have vegetation cover, population density, and the deprivation index. So using those, I'll be able to calculate uh, and figure out the composition and structure and how that changes across the island. An interesting thing about my project is that we use citizen science to inventory these private trees. So um, as I kind of mentioned, there's different people that govern private trees and that makes it really hard to gain this access to this data. Um, there's inaccessibility to sample, especially when people own this land. So what we did is we also used traditional methods such as going out into the field with binoculars and knocking on doors, but we also incorporated citizen science. And with that, we created a project website, we mailed drop flyers, and we did a lot of media outreach in order to reach as many people as possible. And what the citizens did, they were given a protocol where they measured their trees and tried to identify their species and sent it into our website. And this aspect of my project is still ongoing. So people are hopefully going to continue to uh, um, send in their information to us. And we're also hoping to expand this aspect of the project to the entire island of Montreal so that anyone who's interested can send in their trees. It's actually up and running right now, so if anyone here is from Montreal and would like to send in their information, uh, please contact me afterwards. Overall, my project's goal is to get that fine scale information on tree diversity in Montreal across different neighborhoods, because currently we only have citywide biodiversity metrics. 
And with this, I hope that this will allow for more targeted management, um, not only to uh, increase and manage biodiversity across the entire city, but allow for equitable distribution of the services that trees provide to residents across many different areas. I would like to thank my supervisor, supervisors, Carly Zeter and Annie Paquette, as well as my research team and all the funding agencies that made this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That certainly makes for a, a brilliant research project. And um, yeah, looking forward to reading your papers that come out of it. Um, so our next speaker is Eva Hill from California Academy of Sciences. Hello everyone. Um, I'm going to just make sure, if I, see if I can figure out exactly where to point, because I have a lot of animations and this is going to be very painful if uh, I can't nail this down. All right, let me see. Oh, it seems like it sometimes just does not want to do it. Well, um, I guess we'll cross those bridges when we get there. Okay. Huh. Well, um, I'm Avery Hill. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Um, I, oh, broadly, my research concerns uh, how recent human activity. Broadly, my research concerns how recent human activity is affecting the geographic distribution of plants, mostly forest species. Um, the last couple of years, I've been studying uh, something called vegetation climate mismatch, which is uh, this phenomenon where that strong relationship between the vegetation and climate at a locality is eroded due to climate change. Um, next. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, just a brief intro to plant biogeography veget and vegetation climate mismatch, which I've been studying. And then I'll talk about uh, a recent project where we mapped uh, vegetation climate mismatch in uh, California's Sierra Nevada conifer forests, forests we've been colloquially referring to as zombie forests. And then I'll talk about uh, the burgeoning and exciting work that we're um, now embarking on using iNaturalist data, community collected uh, uh, biodiversity data to then explore you know, what vegetation climate kind of mismatch means uh, uh, for many of the understory species. Uh, next. Um, I don't think I need to expound uh, the profound impact uh, that recent environmental change uh, uh, puts on biodiversity uh, to this audience, but I'll say that in, uh, the, at, the, at the scale that I study, uh, the California montane forests, um, wildfire and climate largely determine the, determine the patterning of vegetation and uh, the recent increases in severity and uh, frequency of catastrophic wildfires in California and the increase in temperature and um, the increase in drought events in California are, are driving changes in, in, in local vegetation. Uh, next. And then one more. Um, I think you can, yeah, you can just hit both of these. Um, so vegetation change, uh, uh, when, when, when plants cannot survive and reproduce in uh, novel environmental conditions, uh, they can either, uh, and if they cannot adapt to these uh, conditions, um, they must move. All right. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. Um, cool. Um, so, uh, yeah. When, when vegetation uh, cannot survive and reproduce in an area and it cannot adapt uh, to novel conditions, um, the, the process by which plants move, you know, they can't just walk up slope to uh, 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 suitable conditions. Uh, they must um, move through a combination of processes of uh, range contractions, mortality at one edge of the distribution, and range expansions, colonization at, at uh, newly suitable uh, localities. Uh, in montane regions, this is often at the higher edges of uh, their distributions. Um, these demographic processes are often uh, especially for older, longer-lived tree species, are slower than the rate um, of climate change in a lot of these areas. So we expect that a lot of forests um, uh, are, are changing more slowly than climate change, and there's a lot of big patches of forests where uh, there are trees growing today, but uh, the climate is now uh, apparently unsuitable for these trees, and they're likely to transition to other types of vegetation in the near future. Um, so what happens when uh, the climate changes faster than the vegetation? You end up with uh, this phenomenon, vegetation climate mismatch. Um, and I'll describe it this way. Uh, you have, let's say we have a population of pines and a population of oaks, and uh, they each have um, their kind of suitable climatic conditions. Let's say this is uh, mean winter temperature. Um, as these conditions change or move upslope with climate change, uh, we end up with a patch of pine trees uh, kind of left behind in uh, the area um, that is best suited, in a, in a cl climatic region that is best suited for oak trees. Um, these forests that are experiencing vegetation climate mismatch, and uh, we've been colloquially referring to them as zombie forests. They're kind of the standing dead. Uh, we expect them to transition to uh, uh, lower elevation vegetation, like uh, in, in our systems, um, oak trees or, or chaparral, um, sometime in the near future. And we mapped these forests in, in California and, and, and published a paper on it uh, earlier this year. Um, you can follow that QR code to access the paper. Um, and we found that up to 20% of conifer forests, uh, particularly on the lower elevation, warmer and drier edges of, of, of the mountains, um, are experiencing vegetation climate mismatch. And these forests are dominated by uh, ponderosa pines, Jeffrey pines, um, some sugar pines, and then some cedars as well. Um, and immediately below these forests are often angiosperm or broadleaf dominated forests uh, or shrublands with chaparral and, uh, and, and, and oak woodlands. Um, so we produce these maps uh, and they're pretty coarse in terms of uh, uh, you know, that one kilometer resolution and, and it's just focusing on the dominant tree species and uh, the, 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 the climate, um, what we're interested in now is you know, what's actually happening in these forests. What does it mean for the members of an ecosystem um, that, uh, in, a, in a forest that is experiencing vegetation climate mismatch? So uh, we're interested in kind of the species, various uh, uh, you know, directions to research species composition in these forests. Uh, one direction is looking at conservation targets, like the yellow-legged uh, Sierra, uh, Sierra frog. Um, uh, we're also interested in relative species richness, uh, how species richness differs between um, you know, these zombie forests and adjacent, uh, more stable conifer forests. And then something we're most excited about, I think, and have, have, have done uh, more work on, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, is uh, indicator species. So, Trees, we think, are more s slow to respond to climate change, but uh, at least physically by, by moving their populations. But um, a lot of more mobile species or species with shorter generation times uh, might actually be responding to climate change more quickly, and they might be uh, useful indicators of vegetation climate mismatch um, before it shows up in our more coarse models. Uh, we think that an incredible uh, resource uh, for addressing these questions about species composition uh, is um, the, the community-collected um, iNaturalist data. And I'll say real quick as an aside that um, I've been using the term community science, um, and I, I know that uh, some would describe uh, some of this work, that the work we do in our department, as uh, citizen science. Uh, but citizen science is uh, a little problematic and exclusionary in, in California. And, and, and probably in other places as well. So I use the term community science because uh, uh, that's at least something that we're aspiring to in our department. Um, 
So this is community collected uh, biodiversity data. If you're not familiar with that naturalist, uh, it's a nonprofit that provides a platform and a mobile application uh, for taking pictures of different organisms that you see and uh, uploading uh, the picture, a suggested identification, a timestamp, and a location to a larger database uh, website where they can be verified by, by others and, uh, and then used by, by scientists um, or whoever else who wants to look at the maps. Um, it was founded in 2008, and there's already more than 70 million uh, uh, verified records um, uh, internationally. Um, and in the Sierra Nevada alone, uh, this is a, a, a density map, um, there are almost half a million records in, in our area of study. Uh, these records can reach quite high density, um, up to like 600 observations per square kilometer. And, uh, but this is where you expect it to be, um, like in highly trafficked areas like Yosemite National Park or, or Lake Tahoe area, if you're familiar with those. Um, there's also pretty good, uh, uh, at least relative to, to our other ways that we've been studying vegetation climate mismatch, good spa uh, temporal resolution, where effectively, depending on your scale and that you're looking at, you know, a lot of these areas are, in a way, resampled um, decade by decade or year by year. Um, and you can see uh, in, in, in this count of observations by year, um, I don't have all of 2023 in here, but uh, I believe the trend of exponential growth in observations in the Sierra Nevada uh, will continue. Um, so this is something that, uh, kind of our, our beginning of looking at indicator species um, that we've used from my natural data that, uh, that I pulled earlier this year. Um, here's the, the pie charts are showing uh, the relative occurrence uh, of uh, these three species in either stable conifer forest, the VCM, vegetation climate mismatch, zombie forest, or the broadleaf vegetation that, that is downslope. And you can see that uh, m the majority of uh, these species uh, occurrences are within broadleaf vegetation, this is either chaparral or, um, or oak dominated forests. Um, but when they're in conifer forests, either the brown or the green, uh, you can see barely a sliver of green at the top of the pie chart. Um, they're almost entirely within the zombie forest, the, the vegetation climate mismatch region of these conifer forests. The idea, uh, just from this kind of prelim preliminary analysis, is that when you're in a conifer forest in the Sierras and you see a blue swallowtail butterfly, you're likely standing in an area uh, that's experiencing vegetation climate mismatch. And when uh, Species like the blue swallowtail might be important uh, indicator species in, that you can track uh, um, year by year, decade by decade, to get a better sense of you know, uh, how the climate is changing in these forests and expected uh, transitions in these ecosystems. And these are just three species of, of many, many candidate species that we're looking at. Um, and the, the process by which we decide on some species will be iterative. Um, and uh, will involve some, some ground truthing probably next year as well. Um, I think, to me, one of the most exciting and important parts of this work that we're doing is, um, is not only using the iNaturalist data, but also helping to generate it. Uh, in the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science at the California Academy of Sciences, uh, we collaborat collaboratively lead a number of uh, uh, data collection, biodiversity data collection campaigns, uh, probably the the, the largest of which is the City Nature Challenge, um, which uh, is a three-day annual event where different cities compete to um, uh, uh, collect as many observations as they can. Uh, I think this year we had almost 500 cities participating. Montreal uh, was one of them. Um, and, uh, and each year about a, more than a million, maybe almost two million in 2023 observations were added. Um, so a, a massive amount of data is produced. We also run campaigns that are more uh, either geographically focused or taxonomically focused. Um, and the value of running these campaigns uh, uh, is, is about more than just the, the value of the data that are produced. Um, I think one of the most important parts of this work is, is it helps to build these, going out in the field and, and asking people to, 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 to document the species around them helps to build the relationships that will be so important for uh, figuring out how to respond to impending transitions in, in uh, myriad uh, California ecosystems. Um, 
You may be familiar with the resist, accept, and direct framework for kind of managing lands and transitions, uh, where you can, in the context of, say, zombie forests, you can resist the transition from conifer forest to chaparral uh, by you know, pulling, at, pulling out manzanita bushes. You can accept this transition, or you can uh, direct it. And there's no right answer, um, and it's going to be conditional uh, in various places on kind of the, the costs and the benefits um, and the resources available. And so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process in um, uh, cost-benefit analysis. And in order to uh, really account for all the benefits, we need to think about all the values that people attribute these ecosystems in transition. And I think that one of the most important steps in uh, uh, accounting for uh, these values is um, fostering relationships between people and land to articulate these values and understand them. Um, and that's all I have. Um, I'll just conclude briefly with um, many, the two takeaways are many, many forests in California are experiencing vegetation climate mismatch, and iNaturalist data can help us understand how to respond to impending transitions, um, not only by producing data, but also to help by helping to build relationships. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Avery. Uh, those were very interesting and relevant scientific questions, which you really neatly tied to what the community can do as part of that, that research. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Collin from uh, Technopark Wazo. Okay, so we'll hope for the best. Um, my name is Catherine Collin. It's a pleasure to be with you today representing a, a community science organization, um, a, a conservation group locally in Montreal, Technopark uh, was it. Uh, we are entirely volunteer run um, with a very small budget and we are committed um, across a broad swath of members who come from photography, um, academia, bird watching community to document the biodiversity and ecosystemic value of uh, an area which I'll describe to you uh, as soon as I can get this to go. An area uh, 215, uh, uh, of 215 hectares north of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Airport. So this space is equal in size to Mount Royal. It contains contiguous forest, marsh, and meadowed fields, but it's existing in a highly mineralized uh, heat island in Montreal, as we can see here, as we can zoom in. Uh, sorry for the dense text here, but just to share some of the uh, reflections, characterizations of the site. We had the city in Montreal, a city of Montreal in 2013, uh, describing the site as having a diversity of habitats that make it uh, ecologically interesting for the creation of a nature park, referring to the site as teeming with certain species and containing a 3.7 hectare mature beech grove, which was to be designated as an exceptional forest ecosystem. To the left, more recently, you have the Mohawk Council of Ganawage, who have been um, vocal in their support to see the 215 hectares uh, preserved. Uh, referring to the site as a complex of wetlands, forests, and meadows, and um, uh, advancing the claim that the site is clearly an extremely important refuge for migratory and resident birds and other wildlife on the island of Montreal. So just to give you a few uh, quick uh, pictures of the area, we have the Forêt des Sources. We have one of the three 
Marsh Complexes, Heron Marsh. And we have Champ des Monarques, um, popularly known as uh, Monarch Fields. The site has faced considerable pressures over uh, time, uh, not least due to the fact of its composite ownership, so private developers, uh, crown land, federal government, and uh, municipal land. Uh, there is intense interest in developing the site, which we have seen recently uh, by the company Meltech in 2021 and Hypertech just this year. Um, there have also uh, been instances of degradation to the site due to preparation for eventual development. Uh, Two-thirds of the Echo Campus marshland was drained, a dike was constructed, um, an estimation um, of 4,000 trees were felled. We've had sinkholes open up um, under the marshland due to the tunnel boring machine for our high-speed rail in Montreal, and we've had our nectaring plant fields raised. Um, some of you may be aware of this. Despite of that, um, in, in spite of that, we continue to try and document as best we can um, the biodiversity on site, and we are primarily concerned as a bird conservation organization um, with documenting our avifauna, but as Avery was recently just um, uh, reviewing for us, we see the interrelation, the interpolation, in fact, of, of, of different species. So we are keeping track of birds, but also of butterflies and all the, the various species that enrich the site. Uh, I won't list all of these here for you now, but of note, we have 16 status uh, species that have been documented uh, on site, several of which are nesting species. Uh, we have the least bittern, which has nested uh, in the Technopark marshes for seven consecutive years. We have the short-eared owl, whose presence is known on site with documentation dating from the 1960s. We have the highest concentrations of green-winged teal and American woodcock on the island, and snapping turtle. Notable site for strigiforms, if anyone's around Montreal in the winter and you want to come see eight of Montreal's, of Quebec's, uh, ten strigiforms owls, please come by the Technopark. Um, and we have nesting raptors as well. I apologize for the acronyms of the four uh, letter banding codes, but great horned owl, northern harrier, cooper's hawk, and red-shouldered hawk. And the platforms that we use are, of course, perhaps the traditional ones for community science, eBird, Monarch Watch, and Mission Monarch um, Expert, their new expert protocol, and of course, iNaturalist. And I'll just review for you some of um, our findings or results um, uh, casually gathered uh, through these platforms. We have 220 species of birds that have been documented or recorded on site, um, and uh, participation uh, in, by our members con uh, is aligned in our community science events with contributing eBird uh, checklists. So we participate in global big days, the ones that come up in May, October. October 14th is a big day if you're around Montreal on Saturday, come to the Technopark. And Christmas bird counts, and of course, Project Feeder Watch, we maintain three feeders on site and have documented um, the species counts at those sites. What we've learned from using eBird is that it's important to consolidate the information beyond what appears in the popular leaderboards of eBird. And we do this by using our bar chart tools on eBird, but also Dan Ellsworth's excellent eBird polygon tool script that enables us to extract data from geomatic um, KML polygons that we are able to upload. When we consolidate this data, we see that in fact, on the island of Montreal, the Technopark ranks the highest as an eBird a hotspot um, for the number of species. This is consolidated sub-sectors for all of the nature parks for which there are numerous hotspots. And we see this, this is true not only over the 10-year period, which the previous graph illustrated for you, but also annually. So every year, um, more or less systematically, we will see that the Technopark um, site it ranks the highest for species watch. As I mentioned, we do not content ourselves to simply document um, avifauna uh, biodiversity. We also participate in Monarch Watch and Mission Monarch Expert, and we've just finished um, the tagging season of this year. So uh, the University of Kansas runs Monarch uh, tagging. We see in this graph the days that appear to be the most propitious um, over the past four years, well, 2019 to 2022. Um, we also uh, are able to see the number of um, observations, and these observations are submitted directly to the Mission Monarch um, program that's run through Espace pour la Vie, um, originated through eButterfly. We have observed 670 monarch butterflies uh, on site, and we have tagged 260, suggesting that this is not a staging site, 
but a, a potentially an important migratory uh, corridor. And we have also been able, through our community science observations, to indicate which nectaring plants uh, monarchs have been interacting with. And we can see changes, potentially based on phenology changes, from one year to the next. This year, we had um, a, a thistle more or less disappear from the interactions in a way that we had not seen previously. Um, and south thistle replaced um, it. Um, so plant interactions were able to, to chart those and to make further claims for conservation based on the nectaring plants. Finally, we use uh, iNaturalist. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we place great value in the public-facing nature of this biodiversity profile, both for the information it contains and the potential it has for outreach. We have contributed to other environmental organizations in Montreal, um, helping them set up INAT uh, polygons. We have used iNaturalist data to, com to compile lengthier briefs that we've submitted to, um, for impact assessment. And we continue to uh, participate in the City Nature Challenge. Uh, we are the principal organizers, along with Campus Biodiversity Network, of Greater Montreal City Nature Challenge. We have four projects that run for which the observations are automatic. So once we teach people how to use iNaturalist, people go out into the field and they make those observations. All of those observations are tallied by sector, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And um, we can see the types of species um, that characterize the space. Um, I invite you to go look at those polygons and see the richness of species. Um, in terms of the City Nature Challenge, we again use this as a means of attracting people to the site. It has also been um, a way of um, encouraging um, new observations. We had a rare first for the island of Montreal and a fourth in the entire province of Quebec with uh, the observation and subsequent microscopic validation of Clemassium americanum, American tree moss, which is considered critically imperiled on the island of Montreal and in uh, Quebec. Our final recap in terms of how community science has advanced conservation for us, we're able to supplement rather than replace existing data offered by um, uh, databases such as the CDPNQ. We are able to corroborate existing uh, studies such as those produced by Habitat and the David Suzuki Foundation. We're able to counter claims of low ecological value. We can track invasives. And, but again, I will recur back to this notion of providing a public-facing, evidence-backed approach to local conservation. This has led to tangible, if limited, advances by way of a conclusion. We have 55 hectares of the site have now been zoned for conservation. The Meltec uh, project was withdrawn, and the current um, fear that we have for development by Hypertech We've just received notice in the past few weeks that Hypertech has publicly announced it has found an alternate location to develop. It should be mentioned that this is contingent, of course, on the city buying back the land at developers' prices, so it is not a done deal. But at least there is um, a kind of awareness um, that is linked to um, some of the biodiversity uh, data. And I'll just show you very briefly, we have these unanimous resolutions that were issued by 25 of the municipalities in Greater Montreal. We'll see repeated reference to this notion of 200 species of birds and to monarchs. So the idea that community science kind of trickles into the language of policy decisions as a very dense addendum, which I'm sorry you can't see on the top, we see that these are, these are excerpts from different resolutions where we have uh, reference to the 200 species of birds. For those of you who read French, on the left you have reference to our, um, our organization's work, Technopark Oiseau, in terms of the counting of um, common milkweed. And you have commitments made by the city of Montreal, not only to put a moratorium on development, but also to continue to support biodiversity protections for the common monarch as articulated on a federal uh, level with the change in conservation um, status of uh, the monarch butterfly passing at the Canadian level into endangered um, status. So we hope that our work will continue to contribute to the biodiversity profile of the site for years to come and that we can continue to build the, co the connections and relations that were evoked in presentations earlier. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Catherine. That is an incredibly <laughs> rich, biodiverse, rich site you have there, and the work is incredibly valuable. Um, you know, I think on a global scale, in a, you know, so close to a big city, having that kind of richness is really valuable, and the work you're doing is is exemplary. So uh, thank you. Uh, now uh, next. Um, our presentation is from um, um, Uzma Zaid from the um, uh, Department of Zoology in the Quaid uh, Azam University in Pakistan. Um, and um, Uzma uh, didn't, was not able to get a um, visa. She was waiting until the very last minute, but has recorded her presentation. So um, please go ahead and play the presentation. This local community in Chitral Valley, Hindu Kush French, Pakistan, and it's a pleasure for me to present this work at the Urban Conference in the community-based monitoring and traditional knowledge session. So we all know very well that the global climates have been warming and the northern latitudes and terrestrial regions have warmed up more than oceans. The global climate index uh, has shown Pakistan's position as the eighth most vulnerable country in terms of the water stress, desertification, glacier melting, extreme weather events, and spread of diseases. So here you can see the location of Pakistan on the world's map and its vulnerability index as eighth. Here I'm showing you the Hindu Kush Himalayan region map and uh, Pakistan falls under this uh, HKS region, uh, Hindu Kush Himalayan, Hindu Kush Karakuram and Himalayan region. So it holds a significant uh, for these mountain ranges, having these three ranges in Pakistan all together. So this picture is showing you the junction of these three mighty mountain ranges of Karakuram, Hindu Kush and Himalaya in Gilgit in Pakistan. So the mountain, therefore the mountain regions are a significant region owing to the climate change and sustainable development um, uh, issues and uh, they serve large populations indirectly or indirectly. They show high biological and cultural diversity in terms of fauna and flora and the ecosystem services such as water, food, energy, minerals, medicinal plants, tourism, recreation, aesthetics, and spiritual values. But the local communities in mountains are facing Changing socioeconomic circumstances owing to the impact of climate change and uh, which are impacting their livelihoods as well. And this is documented uh, in the wider literature as well. Uh, also, uh, we came to know that there is high dependence of the Chitral Valley communities on the ecosystem services worth 7,272 US dollar per household per year. Actually, this is my own work from my PhD thesis, but it's not published yet. So the highly rugged and steep mountains of this uh, Hindu Kush Karakuram Himalayan region um, provide habitat to the snow leopard. Uh, so in our study site, which is Chitral Valley, snow leopard is also found, uh, other than the coma leopards, Himalayan lynx, leopard cat, gray wolf, red fox, other carnivore species, and the wild ungulate species such as marfor, ibex, oreal, and the long-tailed marmot. The other dominant plant species in the in Chitral Valley includes pinus, juniperus, salix, populus, ephedra, this tamarix, ephedra, and artemisia species. So this is the biological importance of the Hindu Kush range. The study objectives of this uh, uh, research were to assess and identify the climate change perceptions 
the impacts of climate change on communities livelihoods natural resources and biodiversity and the and the community responses to the, these perceived and climate change impact on the chitral valley so uh, these are the views of the chitral valley with the households um, and the passage you can see the map of the chitral valley showing the 11 survey sites where we were conducting the household interviews so the climate crowd approach was adopted by wwf us uh, they provide a holistic approach how to conduct the key informant and the household in level interviews uh, along with providing the questionnaire also we were using the pakistan meteorological department data for 50 years data to analyze the temperature and precipitation trends in the chitral valley for 50 years so uh, these are the pictures of the chitral valley uh, mountain communities and while we were conducting the interviews well uh, for the research, uh, results we could build up a socio economic profile regarding the age profession education and household size and what we found out was that most respondents were young to middle aged and they were having the profession of farmer and had a metric to intermediate level literacy and had more than 6 family members so applying the chi square statistics we could get to know that there was significant differences in these variables in terms of having the p values less than 0.05 this graph is showing you the mean annual temperature trend in in chitral valley over 50 years time span so we can see a, a gradual increase in the temperature over 50 years from 1973 to 2012 uh, yeah And, and this graph is showing you the mean annual rainfall uh, tem, uh, rainfall trend, trend in in Chitral Valley over 50 years time span, and we can see a gradual decrease in the amount of precipitation in terms of the rainfall. Then, um, regarding the perceived changes in the weather and climate by the local communities, we could see an increase in temperature. as told by the majority of the respondents and the and in the past attacks there was a decrease in the amount of precipitation that is rainfall and snowfall in the winter season and there, there is more ice or glacial melt and the frequent and more frequent extreme climatic events that is flooding and drought also through the chi square statistics we could know that there were significant differences in this Uh, data regarding the p values so getting to know the impacts of impacts on community livelihoods the reduced yield and the livestock impacts were highly impacting the livelihoods of the local communities in the valley followed by the water scarcity issues pastoral land impacts increased health impacts uh, health expenses low business increased disease longer summer season uh, as mentioned by the respondents regarding the impacts on the biodiversity in the valley the human wildlife conflict was considered as the biggest impact to the biodiversity of the valley followed by the habitat degradation and species decline then in order to respond to the impact of climate change on the livelihoods biodiversity and ecosystem services in the valley the communities have been adapting better management practices for water and pest management followed by coping with the new health conditions migration reliance on government support buying fuel wood and fodder from the market illegal hunting and logging habitat encroachment and infrastructure development So after um, uh, 
having getting to know about all this situation in the Chitral Valley, we can say that the mountain landscapes are highly vulnerable to climate changes and this is impacting the livelihoods uh, in this region. Our results complement the literature on the meteorological data trend uh, for Chitral Valley. Our results are con consistent with the wider literature that the drought conditions are negative, negatively affecting mountain grasslands as reported in Austria, Nepal, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and China, resulting in the decline in agrobiodiversity. Also, our results complement studies on extreme climatic events, which result in the displacement and migration of communities. Then we got to know that uh, uh, our results also complement the negative trends of snow cover extent and uh, water scarcity in HKH region and its uh, river basins. Then the human wildlife conflict is significantly affecting the local biodiversity and especially snow leopards. So the livestock insurance, predator-proof corrals and watch and ward practices can help mitigate this problem. The local communities need to be involved in the inclusive decision-making process, resource management and defining governance structures for sustainable mountain development. Then uh, last but not the least, harnessing traditional knowledge systems can be the key to sustainable management in Chitral valleys as these systems provide a holistic understanding of the communities and the environment. So this was all from me, from my side, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, um, our last presentation is also a pre-recorded presentation from Nanan uh, Setiasi from Indonesia Reef Check. Uh, you can run it. Good morning. Selamat pagi. Bonjour. My name is Nanis Tiasi. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Turak and everybody here, everybody there, for giving me the opportunity to share my abstract on public monitoring network as a tool to monitor ecosystem and biodiversity in highly challenging areas. Monitoring is crucial to understanding how ecosystem and biodiversity change over time especially in Indonesia where the threat is escalating and the population is increasing. Yet, it is problematic for Indonesia. It drifts, which contains the highest coral biodiversity in the world, is scattered over thousands of islands. Public reef monitoring is one of the solutions. Reef check survey is an international standardized public reef monitoring. In Indonesia, it was started as a one area project in 1997 under the WWF. And in 2023, the network can reach out to almost all provinces with coral reef. 
in 2006, the certification system was introduced. So if you see here, the volunteers, the 1,500 reject volunteers, were still dominated by those who did not follow the standard training and test, while the reef checkers in here are already standardly trained. It ranges from a PhD, a professor at universities to local fishermen. Note that since the development of the network in 2003, there is no dedicated resources allocated to run the network. As Riftic Energy Network could reach out to many provinces in Indonesia, it is a logical choice to mobilize them when coral bleaching is happening. Uh, during coral bleaching, we need uh, data from widespread area, and it has to be taken fast, fast, fast. And this is problematic because for big organizations like big NGOs or government, uh, they are confined to a yearly budgeting. And our technology is not yet enough to, hi, next year we'll be bleaching. Let's put a bleaching monitoring budget in the next year annual budget. No, we don't have yet that uh, ability. So this network of individuals, small organization, uh, and those who could flexibly take action is really important. Coral Bleaching Indonesia Network was established in 2009 to respond to the bleaching events using the Reflect Network as the backbone. The Coral Bleaching Network, still providing the most widespread data of coral bleaching up until the last one in 2016. 2009-2011 mass bleaching event in Indonesia provided us with insights how important it is to work as a network and to have local stakeholders as our eyes. It is interesting to point that the first one that tipped the first domino, domino card that triggered the bleaching report was local community. As we can see from the map, nothing was alarming. No bleaching alert until a friend of mine, a fisherman from Bali, called me and asked, Nan, why the coral becoming white? Then we remember that in the last mass bleaching event in 1798, Bali was bleached a year earlier. So we contacted our peers and friends, easy to do with the network, to watch for their ribs. Sure enough, a year, a year later, boom boom, we received bleaching reports from 63 sites all over Indonesia. Yay, we received a lot of data! So then we work, we try to categorize the, the bleaching state, and then we started to notice something worth exploring. If we can, if we see here, the, the, the reefs in Bali was not that bad compared to the reefs in Aceh, which is kind of outside of what we usually understand about bleaching because the temperature stress in Aceh is nothing compared to the temperature st stress faced by the reefs in Bali. As we look into historic, historical temperature data for Bali and Aceh, we notice that reefs in Aceh has been living in a more stable temperature compared to the reefs in Bali. So we hypothesize that reef in Bali was somehow more used to temperature stress compared to reefs in Aceh. This kind of information, this kind of hypothesis will not be there if it wasn't because this local fisherman tipped the first domino card. Understanding something at such a global level cannot rely only on scientific data submitted by scientists. In 2009-2011, Reefbase only received bleaching report from four sites. That would not be enough for us to dig deeper, let alone come up with a hypothesis that help us understanding coral bleaching better. Mr. Turak already summarized for us that interest, knowledge, capability of local communities can be powerful drivers of transformative change, and a network is a powerful tool to support them. This is aligned with what RIFCEC are experiencing in establishing and running RIFCEC and Coral Bridging Network. High quality information, continuous resources, and network support 
are the foundation to understanding how ecosystem and biodiversity change over time, especially in a vast and challenging geographic area. Knowledge and capability are really important because the quality of citizen science data is often questioned. That's what RIFTEC is trying to overcome by developing a standardized curriculum and test with several levels of certification uh, from RIFTEC Discovery up until RIFTEC Instructor. Some of us probably think, hmm, that's a kind of similar with diving certification. Yes, it is. It was developed in such a way that the diving industry could easily integrate it into their business in the hope to raise their interest. Integration into diving business is important, especially as the network also facilitating a cross-subsidy mechanism, as well as integrating recheck or coral bleaching monitoring into government uh, system or university curriculum to help with the resources needed. Uh, coral bleaching Indonesia network is now hosted by Ministry of Marine and Fisheries Indonesia. While 10 years ago, social media is the thing to connect people, now we started to notice a social media fatigue, a saturation of utilization of social media. I mean, my WhatsApp account has so many groups that are so confusing for me which one I want to follow. Therefore, any network and how we communicate has to be simple. We have 1,500 plus reef checkers, but in our WhatsApp group, we only have 78 active members because we know that each member has another WhatsApp groups that can further channel information as required. Reef Check Indonesia Network sustained over two decades without dedicated funding because we have enough dedicated people and no authorship, no single organization own it. And it's managed with friendship manner. Almost every member know another member personally or know someone that this other member knows personally. Uh, we said happy birthday to each other, not by automatic system, but we literally chat to say happy birthday or congratulations for new baby, Indonesian uh, congratulations for uh, when their kids graduated from their kindergarten, etc. etc. And of course, Indonesian culture helps uh, because everybody is a friend. Well, we rarely say my colleague or someone I know, like for example, if uh, I shake hand with Mr. Turak and say, hey Mr. Turak, my name is Nan, how are you? Tomorrow, I could probably say something like, hey, yesterday uh, my friend Mr. Turak uh, told me that, blah, blah, blah. So this friendliness uh, glue more of these dedicated people to keep working and to grow and expand their dedication to another people. So in sum, local community plays an important role to provide quality data and information on the ecosystem, especially at a global scale, and is the key in identifying changes on the ecosystem. And network is important to provide continuous support and to reduce total cost. So what next? Uh, I really hope from this workshop, I can build a connection to other similar network of other ecosystem. My work has pretty much focused on marine and coastal, so it will be nice to kind of uh, reach out to the whole ecosystem and to other public monitoring network, especially related to the climate change, to learn from each other, including on how to develop and maintain network sustainably. And the second one is to raise interest and find resources to support local communities to raise their voice directly. At the Asia Pacific Coral Reef Symposium 2023, this June in Singapore, I co-chair a similar session. Uh, we open opportunity for local community to come and present their own case. We provided a mini workshop on how to make a presentation and a translator. Having heard the story firsthand provided us with an opportunity to know details that are likely missed if their story is presented by their NGOs, university, or government partners. 
and it also put them in the same importance as other players in ecosystem management. So, terima kasih. Thank you. Merci. Uh, hope we can keep in touch. Uh, that's my email. Uh, come back to you, Mr. Turek.